Reality is not always as it seems. Sometimes the people closest to you are the ones who could turn your life upside down. My name is Tiffany. I have been a manager in a bank in Bamako for almost three years, and I am going to tell you about the most chaotic day in my life. Before we continue with the story, do not forget to click on the notification button in order to get notified at every new story posted. Thank you. I had implanted the spirit of independence so much in me that I started working while I was still in high school. I was a cashier in the supermarket in my small hometown. Then, when I went to university, I was a waitress in the cafeteria on my campus. And besides, I had popularity thanks to this little job, which at the end, with the connections I made, allowed me to get a very well-paid job with a permanent contract at the Atlantic Bank of the capital city of my country. My parents were proud of me for sticking by the goals I told them I was going to attain. In addition to the fact that the feedback they had from our relatives who were affiliated with the bank where I worked were excellent. I'll mention the smile that I kept on my face all the time and above all my friendliness and my speed in dealing with all their files. All these positive remarks motivated my parents to finally allow me to leave the family home and settle on my own in a building located in the neighborhood very close to the place of my work. Once in my new building, my smile and spirit of charity never left me because I met my closest neighbor Patrick who had just also acquired his independence and was living a life of single worker. We became friends to the point of sharing even the most ridiculous things like sponges for plates. Despite all this closeness, our relationship remained completely platonic and it was not a problem for any of us. Besides, Patrick even often used to give me his opinion about my boyfriends while I did the same with all his girlfriends that were parading in his apartment. Life continued its usual course between my comings and goings to the bank, my very late returns, and my weekends stuck between cleaning and shopping to fill the fridge the next week. This is how during one of my overbooked Saturdays, I received a strange phone call. While I was in my bathroom sorting out the laundry that needed to go through the washing machine, my phone rang. On the other end of the line was a voice that was completely unfamiliar to me. The croaking voice of a man who seemed to be in the habit of smoking cigarettes. I recognized this type of voice since my paternal uncles had seen their vocal cords damaged by this bad habit. The gentleman, after three hellos, ended up hanging up. A few seconds later, the same number called me back. The same scenario happened with the gentleman with the croaking voice. This time, he didn't just say hello, but said my first name while wondering if I was in a quiet enough place to talk about something very important. I replied saying yes, and he told me to sit very comfortably because it was not only going to be serious, but very long. I was already starting to lose patience, but I had to act like an adult, and I took my time to listen to him. That's when he passed the phone to someone else. There, I was starting to get irritated. The second gentleman on the other end of the line didn't just say my first name, but said my full name, which freaked me out. I couldn't help asking who I was talking to while trying to hide the panic in my voice. It was then that the most disturbing conversation began. So, Miss Stephanie Keita, the heartbreaker. Sorry, I don't understand. Why are you calling me that? Calm down. I am the one asking questions here. Please be brief. I have a lot to do. Miss Keira, do you like playing? Dear sir, if this conversation will be wasted on trivialities, I'll hang up. It was after saying these words that my correspondent nonchalantly but confidently said the number of my street, then the name of my building, and the number of my door, then let out a sarcastic laugh. At that statement of these personal details, I froze, overtaken with fear. Despite everything, I did not want to show him my terror. I replied in an authoritative voice. What do you want? <sighs> We are getting more polite. So I'll keep it simple. I want two million francs cash deposited in the public bench at the bottom of your building tomorrow at 5 p.m. in exchange for the promise to leave you alone forever. Are you serious? Where am I going to find such a sum of money? Stephanie Keira. 
you are an account manager at the Bank Atlantique in Bamako. You have been working there for two years and have several clients who trust you blindly. I could not understand how a foreign person was able to have such information about me. So little by little, it seemed clear to me. Either my correspondent was a relative or had obtained this information from a relative. Unfortunately for me, in this situation, I was in a weak position. He knew everything about me while I knew absolutely nothing about him for the moment. So I had to play the fake sympathy to be able to get as much information as possible from the person. It was then that I softened my voice and began to speak with more femininity and softness. Not to mention that I had launched the voice recorder to allow the conversation be recorded in the smallest details. This would serve as evidence in case I had to file a complaint. You know, I have clients who trust me, but that doesn't guarantee that I'll get that sum of money. What if we made a deal? Which, Miss Kada? I'll just make you a bank transfer of 200,000 francs and we can forget about this whole issue. During this time, I had put my conversation on a loudspeaker and I was trying to send a message to my neighbor explaining to him the situation by texting and asking him to call the police. And that's when my caller said something that made me tilt in my head. Miss Keita, on the right shelf of your kitchen, by the way, which is magnificent, you have an alignment of several spices. On the second level, you have a series of long kitchen knives. You know what I'll do to your little neck with those knives? That's when it came back to me. Even my parents weren't aware of how I had organized my kitchen because I was the one who was always moving from my apartment to the big family house over the weekends. The only person who knew exactly how my kitchen was organized was my neighbor, Patrick. He had gotten into the habit very often coming into my house unexpectedly when I was there to get a bottle of spices or some salt. And very often he would borrow my kitchen knives to be able to cut his meat. I understood that it could only be him. So I quickly stopped trying to send him a message but rather sent a message to my dad while maintaining the conversation with my correspondent. I sent him the telephone number of my correspondent, asking him to contact my uncle Philip who was from the police so that he could trace the location of the latter. I continued to speak with him so as keeping the whereabouts trackable. This is how the call was localized at one kilometer away from my building. While I was still talking to him, the police raided where he was and that's how they caught my neighbor Patrick. Once at the station, during their interrogation, he was asked the reasons for this attempt to intimidate me and he responded by telling the officer that he urgently needed some money. Apparently, he had gotten himself into an investment project that had totally failed, leaving him with a debt of 2 million francs that, was, that he was unable to repay. Knowing that I worked in a bank, he took advantage of our friendship to set a trap on me. Listening to his testimony, I realized how wicked the world could be. As a safety measure, I left my apartment for my family home while waiting to find another accommodation. The lesson I learned from that event is that evil never comes from far. Very often, it roams around disguised as our loved ones.